Thank you, Dr. Srini. I think we've been doing this year on year, and uh, my topic will be repeated diarist touch during FACO, and what is that next? I'm sure most of you who are doing FACO have at some point of time uh, got this problem, and you know what the iris is going to do you. It is not going to leave you. It is going to follow you, irritate you, and make your life miserable. So that, uh, so what exactly? So, so that's it. Now, once you touch, you're done. The iris is always going to come to you all the time, and uh, until you go out, and sometimes it, you feel like as if you just cut off the iris and go ahead with the. Uh, surgery, especially if it is sub -incisional. So what are the causes? The main causes are, again, uh, especially uh, beginners not respecting the central safe zone. What, when I mean central safe zone, the idea of central safe zone is all, the definition is clear for all of us, but when we go inside, we forget that simple fact that apart from irrigation, any aspiration, FACO, should be done in the central safe zone, not beyond the central safe zone. If it is a small people, obviously in IFIS and high fluid dynamics and in case of surge, that is what exactly happened there. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? We need to reduce the fluidics the moment you have that. Ensure that you respect the central safe zone and the aspiration port away from the iris. And you can use the second instrument if you are, but as beginners, if anybody beginner is there, it becomes tough. Then iris hook or some rings uh, might definitely be of some help for you. So, the, the same case, as you keep doing, the, as you keep doing, you just stop there, and luckily, that is the simple touch, it was side away, what you do is turn, turn that, and you have enough space here, you, you do all the FACO here, rotate the nucleus towards that portion, and go, you can go ahead and do the surgery. And again here, you have to make sure that you end, uh, respect the safe, safe zone. Then using the central uh, second instruments to block the iris. See, if you go ahead, you can do that. And in this case, I am showing as a uh, IA, but even in FACO also, it, it does happen. So what you do is just take a Sinsky hook there, keep it, keep it as a guard, and then you can go ahead and easily remove even the sub cortex. And sometimes, if it's in the other side, like here, the iris will get stuck into the, that's it's a blessing in disguise in the side port, it's a blessing in disguise, you still go ahead, can go ahead and do. And aspiration port, so you just have to make sure that the aspiration port is always away from the site which you have touched. The other iris parts will never come to you, it is only these portions which uh, keep coming to you. So all the aspiration you do with the aspiration port away, with that you can go ahead and uh, somehow manage. But in the very severe cases, you may have to use one or two hooks. In this, in, in usually because the touch is on one side, you can use a single hook. But if you have a very small pupil, you can go for multiple hooks or a ring and go ahead and do. In the, uh, and the, the idea, the base idea is respect the central safe zone and ensure all your fluidics and other parameters are within the central safe zone. By this, you should be able to uh, ensure that even if you have a bad touch, one is ob obviously prevention, the other is if you do have, you have one, two, three, plan A, plan B, plan C, which is going to help you out. Uh, Srini, can I do this next one? Yeah. yeah. Finished on time, probably I can, we can have some discussion after my second talk. The second talk is, uh, mine is a wound burn. Technically, wound burn is called corneal incision contracture. I'm sure all of you, again, would have at this some point of time, but the pathology, pathology basically here is, what happens is it's characterized by corneal tissue whitening, basically tissue contracture wound gape, striae, and distortion. Here what happens when the temperature at the incision reaches 60 degrees, the burn is so fast, within the first three seconds it happens. And the incidence is uh, uh, very rare, of course. Now what is the cause? The cause, you have to understand, what are the causes, mechanism? So mainly there are, uh, there is uh, two sources of uh, heat generation. One is 
during electric energy to mechanical, that is the piezoelectric, and the frictional heat uh, uh, when the vibrating micro uh, fake needle comes in contact with the sleeve. So the sleeve and the conversion of electrical, that is the heat generating part. So what actu actually happens is everything goes well, you won't have a problem. Most of the time we feel that it is when you use high power, that is when you get, but that is the confounding factor. The main factor is either the irrigation is less or stopped or the aspiration is blocked. So these are the two major first first line things. The moment you have something there, if the irrigation is l low or if the aspiration is blocked, that, that is when you have to get make sure that, okay, now I, have a, I may get a problem. So before you even proceed, you should ensure. The second, the confounding uh, factor is power, high power. High power is not the first cause. The first cause is irrigation, lower irrigation. What is the effect of thermal energy on the coronal layers? On the epithelium, it, it is uh, no sequelae. It just causes coagulative energy. By next day, you're normal. It is the stroma. With the stroma, it causes irreversible contracture. And that is where we all end up in problems. Endothelium, obviously, it is only a cell loss. One or two days, you'll have some edema, few uh, week, uh, the adjacent cells will take over. So the problem is how you're going to manage the, um, the uh, stroma. So as you said, uh, dense cataract is a confounding factor. Type of settings when you're using, nowadays most of us don't use continuous, but those of you who are using now can switch over, especially if you're doing the divide and conquer, you could switch over to the hyperpulse or pulse or high, uh, micro pulse modes. That definitely because it gives you the gap, the cooling gap in between, so that will help you. And uh, make sure that you use the excess additional FACO only on occlusion. Uh, before and after you can avoid so thereby you use less of the FACO power and obviously mechanical techniques like chop will be of much help so this is one other cause of sleeve compression when you have when I say when you have a sleeve compression here if it is here there is fluid passing through the fluid should be passing in through the sleeve outside and also uh, should be aspirated when the fluid is coming in and going out the temperature is controlled if either of them is blocked so that is when you end up in, <coughs> in wound, wound heats. The other major cause is sometimes is thermogenic, that is dispersive effect, especially when you use uh, this uh, viscoat, which are very high dense. They can go and block, and then you go ahead. Initially, what you'll have, you'll have occlusion. Even without uh, the tip getting occluded, you will have occlusion sounds coming. That is when you have to be careful. Or you may have this milky white sign, which indicates that okay, there is a occlusion block. If you keep going for uh, ahead, that means the irrigation aspiration is blocked, the wound burn is going to happen. So be careful when you have white cloud signs, lens milk sign, leak incision, that is you'll have the bubbles there and you'll start seeing initially. You have only three, four seconds in case there is complete blockage of irrigation aspiration and if you press it, within three seconds you'll have the uh, wound burn there. So that you have to be very careful. That is why you have to look for these signs. So what is the sequelae there? In usually it is manageable, especially in the hard cataracts, but if you really have it because of the blockage, then there will be fish mouthing, which is very important because the wound, though it appears you're closed, will not close. That is where management becomes very important. Uh, prevention is very important. First, test the fluid, test the in inflow irrigation. Many times the irrigation water is over, you're doing the third case, fourth case, water is over. You just go in and that is when you finish, you get the wound burn. So check for it. See for the compression of the sleeves. Use appropriate settings for the nuclear de uh, density unless otherwise required. Don't go for the high settings. And avoid overfilling over day. This is one thing that most of them, there are some, some people who actually go in, first aspirate the central part of the visco and then go ahead with the FECO per se. So that is a good uh, technique because sometimes we ourselves don't know uh, what type of visco we're using. And many times we are going and keeping on filling with the, especially if you're using visco, that is very, you have to be careful. Create a uh, fluid pocket, aspirate the anterior cortex initially and this part of epinucleus. And once you see the nucleus, then you can go and do your trenching or your regular film. That way you're sure that there is free flow, there is no obstruction to the aspiration. And be alert to visible signs of decreased flu fluid flow. That is a Lens milk, lens milk sign, that is very important. That, that is one sign and the other sign, important sign is 
there is occlusion. Be, be careful about the ears, your the music. Occlusion sign without the tip getting occluded. That means there is aspiration block. So that you have to be very careful. Treatment, most of them you can manage. Fish mouthing of the section is very important. Many times we overlook it. That is one of the causes for post-operative. So if you are not sure, you can do a Seedles test and you should suture. Um, I have one minute time. Yeah, okay. So you have to suture and the suture technique also, many things have been described. I'll just go in brief about that. And if it is severe, uh, we may need for some um, AMT scleral patch graft or pericardium patch graft. Uh, mostly we can manage with suturing and uh, wound suturing with BCL. The only disadvantage at this point of view is high amount of post-operative astigmatism that you have to be very careful. So most of us do put these radial sutures. In such cases, you have to be careful, recheck, because this the radial sutures will not be sufficient, if especially if there is fish mouthing. Some of them, what they suggest is use the anterior, uh, the roof, and directly to that. Don't involve the posterior, because our problem is the fish mouthing. So to avoid, uh, because you just put a radial, radial suture, the fish mouthing will not be uh, solved. So one is one is that. The other is use a compressional suture, horizontal mattress suture. So two one radial suture and one comp one one uh, horizontal suture. That's the mattress suture. Um, if I have time, I'll just go through this. And most of us now, with the advent of BCL and uh, cyanacrylate glue, we are managing with that. But it takes a long time. Post-operative sequelae will be. Uh, you have to keep in mind those things in mind. The other is. There is a conjunctival flap. Use a double armed, use a double armed uh, ten zero. Go through this. Go through the superior uh, the conjunctiva from one one arm. The other is from this side into the sclera, and then you then you just tie. It goes below below, and the wound is nicely covered. This is in case you have uh, fish mouthing where it is not uh, closing, and there is a nice burn with corneal contracture, the stromal contracture. And obviously, in severe cases, you go. We can go for very rare, very rare uh, scleral graft. But these are there theoretically. We can uh, look into it. Very there. And uh, autologous uh, tenons plug also is there. The same thing. You just go and plug. It gets healed very well. But with the advent of cyanocrylate glue, this becomes uh, glue. This becomes obsolete. And pericardium. I don't think anybody has done. That's basically for theoretical purposes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Srini. Anything in discussions? We can have. Uh, uh, thank you, Mesh. Uh, we will we'll, uh, do the discussions. Uh.